Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we were talking in the room a moment ago how the silence here and the setup's a little bit like church service, so we'll try and move beyond that. Um, and let me say uh, welcome to you all. Um, very nice to see friends in the room and know about friends and colleagues uh, uh, out in the Zoom world as well for those. I haven't met on Peter Konoski, I'm Professor of Forestry here in the Fenner School. I've been Professor of Forestry at ANU since 1995. I still think of myself as with some of my colleagues in the room who joined about the same time as just a young aspiring academic. And, uh, that's a good place to, to be. Uh, I'm talking today uh, about the future of forests and forestry, and that's obviously of core uh, professional and personal interest to me, as it is to many of you. Uh, and so I hope that my reflections help stimulate some discussion um, in the time that we have uh, today, but also subsequently. Um, I want to begin, of course, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country on which we meet, uh, the Ngunnawal and the Gambri people, and pay our respects to their elders, past and present, but also acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of country um, from where uh, you're joining us around the country. I'll go back to the opening slide and just uh, remark on the image there, which many of you will know is the flag of the Australian Forestry School. Uh, the first report that I can find about that flag is from the Adelaide Chronicle in 1927, which recorded that this flag uh, had been uh, hoist over the new Australian Forestry School at Yarralumna that had moved to Canberra from Adelaide, where it had opened uh, the year before. Uh, those of you who know, know this image would uh, or who are indeed, you know, savvy Australian foresters would recognise it as a red gum. Um, and uh, the Latin um, inscription, Mihai Cura Futuri, which I chose as the um, sort of working title for this seminar, um, seems to be contested, the Latin translation, uh, I guess, between those who are attached to formal Latin and those who might have a more colloquial version, if that's possible. Um, the vernacular version that I've always understood um, was we care for the future or um, my care is for the future. So there's some variations on that theme, but that's essentially the, the sense. And it is, of course, a very appropriate um, uh, inscription for uh, a profession whose responsibility is about um, time frames that are, um, can be uh, at least in decades and perhaps in centuries or millennia. I think it's also a nice um, sort of uh, closing of the circle. Those of you who are ABC listeners would know that the red gum was voted Australia's tree of the year 2022 by radio national listeners or ABC listeners or some group of informed people like that. Um, and so as the most widely distributed eucalypt in Australia um, and one of the most significant in many parts of our riverine parts of our landscape, um, it's nice to um, be able to reflect on its, on its long-standing recognition. We're at ANU and I want to also acknowledge the particular um, uh, generosity of the traditional owners in uh, gifting ANU the name Cambry for uh, our new uh, centre of campus um, and for more generally uh, the work that they're doing with us at ANU um, uh, in a whole range of academic arenas, including in our own here in the Fenner School. Because this is uh, lectures part of the 15 years of Fenner series, I thought I'd begin with a little acknowledgement uh, of that, um, of Frank Fenner, uh, uh, you know, an outstanding Australian uh, scientist and a, such a nice person. Um, met those of us who've been at ANU a while before uh, Frank's passing, had the opportunity to meet him like many before us. He was the first uh, after doing things like, you know, solving uh, smallpox and whatever else that he did as a virologist. He was the first director of the Centre for Resource and Environmental Studies, one of the precursor schools uh, to, um, to the Fenner School, along with the former Department of Forestry. And in my no, never thrown away files are some documents that colleagues who were part of the Fenner School, precursor schools then, 
uh, might recognise. Um, uh, and I was good to find those because they spoke to the work that we did together in our then separate entities of uh, the School of Resources, Environment and Society that itself had been formed from Forestry and Geography, the Centre for Resource and Environmental Studies to form the Fenner School. And I'd like to acknowledge Professor Will Steffen, um, uh, who had a, a foundational role in that, Professor Mike Hutchinson, who was the interim director of Cress at the time. And you know, there's a couple of representations that we used uh, at that time about what we wanted the school to be. And I think um, it's good to look back on those and see that I think we have given effect to those ambitions for the interdisciplinary work uh, of the Fenner School. We also you know, had an exciting range of yearbooks before everything went virtual. Um, and so there's a few historical documents like this, um, including a whole page on our uh, social activities, which um, uh, has been a challenge to maintain over the last couple of years. Oh, in celebrating 15 years of Fenner, we're also acknowledging 95 years of forestry education in Canberra. This is a picture of the opening uh, of the Australian Forestry School at Yarralumla, the site subsequently occupied and now vacated by CSIRO. Uh, the Governor General um, and the Prime Minister are the two main figures that you see there uh, at the opening. The Forestry School continued um, in its own right for around 40 years and then uh, its functions were absorbed into the new ANU Department of Forestry. Um, uh, picture of the late Duke of Edinburgh um, on the opening day or the day he opened the, the forestry building. Um, and after about another 40 years, um, the Department of Forestry uh, metamorphosized into um, first uh, the School of Resource and Environment Society and then the Fenner School. And there's our then uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor Chubb, um, with some luminaries in the background, um, uh, celebrating that um, uh, establishment of uh, the School of Resources and Environment and Society prior to Fenner. Um, it strikes me today for those who aren't in Canberra, uh, it's pretty arctic outside. Um, and I was reminded of Laurel Hill and seeing my colleague Jeff Carey here who um, uh, led the development of a great learning program, field learning program in midwinter at Laurel Hill. I'm, I'm minded to think of how we were all nearly at Laurel Hill instead of in Canberra. It was only EHF Swain, the conservator of forests in Queensland, who saved generations of forestry students the, um, the opportunity to spend their days at what became Laurel Hill Prison Farm. <laughs> um, and the climate today is a bit Laurel Hill-esque. Uh, I'm also minded, just looking at this couple of slides, that the first uh, another circularity is that the first uh, principal of the Australian Forestry School, Norman Jolly, was amongst the first cohort of Australian Rhodes Scholars from South Australia, uh, 1903. Um, and I'm the fourth Australian forester who's been a Rhodes Scholar, um, Victor Grenning. And um, uh, my age is, is weary me, John Chinner from Melbourne. Um, uh, and I guess you might say I'm the last principal of a standalone department of forestry at an Australian academic institution, at least for the moment. So there's a sort of circularity there as well. Welcome everybody who's just made it through the sleet to, to get here. Um, so I want to move, um, well, no, let me, one more slide, okay. So I just wanted to reflect a little bit about, um, you know, the generations of foresters that, that um, multi-stage history of forestry education helped educate. Um, there's a 1937 movie poster called Tall Timbers with some, you know, handsome or beautiful, depending on your interpretation of that picture, Forrester wooing the other party, um, sort of heroic era of uh, foresters out in the bush. Heroic image of my dad, um, who was a graduate of the Australian Forestry School, and that picture was taken um, at Goodnight Scrub, west of Bundaberg in, in 1957. Uh, and then, you know, a few weeks ago, a group of our current students joined a group of Forestry Australia members in a field class in which we revisited Laurel Hill in slightly warmer conditions. And Jeff usually 
goes there. I was going to include a picture of Suzette Searle with the Governor General. So Suzette's here in the in the uh, in person audience for those who who um, don't read the Canberra Times. There was a very nice picture of Suzette in her role as uh, president. Is that the right word, Suzette, of the Wattle Day Committee? Um, with the Governor General on the 1st of September. So that would have rounded off that Suzette's here in person. We won't get it to come to the camera, but you know that she's here. Um, moving then from that bit of context to think about my topic, um, which is the future of forests and the future of forestry. And I focused on Australia, um, although I think that much of you know, how I'm thinking about that future is also relevant elsewhere, but the, the focus of today's um, seminar is really, I've thought about it as a focus on, on Australia. And I've got three sort of broad topic areas uh, to, to uh, emphasise. And the first I've, I've called First Nations Country because uh, of course, um, all of this country all of this continent is First Nations country and the uh, most recent State of Environment report, that's the uh, images on the left-hand side of this um, graphic, um, have some representations of that with um, uh, the colouring is the form of the recognition like of First Nations uh, ownership pre-colonisation, um, uh, 1965 before uh, right for First Nations Australians became formalised and then progressively 1983, 2021. Uh, the map on the right is from a recent report by colleagues in ABES, a very informative report, I think, and an important report because it emphasises the significance of the what's been called the Indigenous estate in, in some of the academic literature. The, uh, um, those parts of Australia's landscape. This is map is for forests, the one on the right, um, but you could uh, map that as in the left-hand side for land more generally, um, that uh, First Nations Australians, traditional owners now have uh, various forms of formal rights over more than 50% of Australia's forests, as it should be. And I'm arguing we should be mo moving to 100% in some way or other. Um, the, the forms in which that ownership uh, and those rights are exercised are quite um, complex and um, the chart at the, at the bottom, which I won't try and explain, uh, is a way of illustrating that complexity and it varies from full uh, ownership and uh, management rights, if I can put it that way, equivalent to freehold land, to land in which the rights are really quite circumscribed. And that latter category is probably still the majority. But nevertheless, I think realising the extent of progress in this arena was a, was a revelation for me, a welcome revelation, I think a very important foundation for the next steps. That made me think about the academic work that's been done in this school or its precursors and by other colleagues um, uh, around the sort of general arena of uh, First Nations Australians uh, responsibilities for and management for their country, the sort of work that Richard Baker and colleagues were doing a couple of decades ago, uh, a screen grab in the middle from work that Sue Feary, um, one of our PhD scholars from more than a decade ago did with um, Richard Baker, John Altman and, and myself. And then more recently, a paper by one of our ANU's current PhD scholars former uh, Fenner alumnus, um, Barmy Williamson, uh, thinking about uh, the expression of cultural burning and the um, First Nations people's uh, perspectives on that in relation to the perspectives that those of us who are not Indigenous have. So I think it's very heartening to see, and I'd like to acknowledge the role that ANU is playing, many colleagues in ANU and many of our, our scholars are playing in fostering the voice of First Nations scholars in uh, addressing the issues that we have to face in, in forest management. So, you know, I think the trajectory that the nation is on finally, after, you know, the hiatus of, uh, let's say the last 20 years, 
is one of uh, reconciliation in the more complete sense of the word, one of restoring traditional owners' rights over country, and then one of, I've said co-empowering co because it's, I think we need to see that relationship as those of us who are not Indigenous being empowered by our acknowledgement of uh, First Nations rights and, and the work that we do to empower them, I think reciprocally empowers us together. Uh, and the screen grab I have there from um, uh, Emma Lee and co-authors, including Helen Ross at UQ, is, is a paper that I think speaks to a really important element of the work that we with interest in forests can do in relation to reconciliation. And they argue in that paper that um, um, asserting, um, enabling the assertion of, of traditional owner rights over country is a, is a form of meaningful, practical reconciliation that is complementary to, not a substitute for, the more symbolic re uh, uh, reconciliation that um, is also important. So I think that there's a role for us, in a, a very important role for us in that, in that process. And uh, so you know, a series of pictures that just illustrate some of the ways in which that's already happening and the trajectories that we're on, um, uh, we already see in a number of jurisdictions the um, commitment to um, co-management or um, transfer of management responsibilities in different ways to traditional owners. That's happened most fully in our protected areas of state. Uh, and I think that it's a shame that the state forest estate has, has lagged behind in that. I think there are enormous opportunities for those of us concerned with the management of state forests uh, to uh, foster that um, stronger uh, relationship, building on a long tradition of partnership uh, between those responsible for forest management and for and traditional owners. Uh, so that's where I wanted to leave the first of the points that I, I think are important about the future. And it's about a future in which First Nations, uh, which Australia and, and its jurisdictions empower First Nations owners um, in their capacity and the agency they have to take responsibility for their country, for their forests. And we find ways to work, we who are not Indigenous find ways to work with them in that on terms that are acceptable for them, but, and also not, but, and also deliver outcomes for what Australia values as a whole. Uh, the second topic um, is an obvious one, I think, as well, that of uh, forests in a, a warming climate, and uh, those, some in the room, might have been fighting that uh, fire out in uh, Tidbin Villa in January uh, 2020 when the, the picture was taken. Uh, the phenomena that we're seeing here, of course, um, of uh, landscape scale, fire events of unprecedented severity is being um, you know, repeated in other parts of the world. Um, and you know, we've become familiar with graphics like the one that's here from uh, the most recent State of Environment report uh, around the changes in the um, number of dangerous fire days with red, darker red being the greater increase. And, Know, that's reflected in uh, so much of, of our experience in this continent and, and elsewhere. Uh, with that comes a whole series of debates around the roles of different forms of land management, um, the um, approach to fuel reduction burning that uh, foresters pioneered in Australia over the last century, analyses like the one that uh, Ross Bradstock and his colleagues um, from the University of Wollongong have done looking at the impacts of the major fire events on resource availability and thinking through the implications for sustainable forest management. We've also got a very active debate, including with by and with colleagues here in the Fenner School around the impacts of uh, forest management activities, particularly timber harvesting uh, on 
fire severity and, uh, and other um, uh, manifestations of fire regimes. Um, uh, I'm on record as uh, arguing that I think that um, uh, as with the work of David Bowman that I have a screen grab uh, of there, that under the sort of extreme fire conditions that we experienced in 19, uh, in, in 2019-20, um, the um, what we might think of as the legacy impacts of, of timber harvesting or other forest management activities, including fuel reduction burning, are just overwhelmed by the climatic conditions um, and the intensity of, um, of the fires. Uh, but clearly, you know, the situation we experienced a few years ago um, challenges our thinking about how we should manage uh, our forests in the face of that changing climate. And there are people in this room who are, who are working on that. Uh, I think it's going to challenge us all um, to, to think that through. We've also got continuing contestation about the role of forest management in other forest values. Um, screen grabs here from a couple of recent publications. Um, one from um, Ecology and Evolution, um, looking at the threats to Australian biodiversity. Uh, across all sectors and here's forestry here. Um, the size of the bar is an assessment of the size of the threat. Um, a report from uh, a group of uh, researchers, including some colleagues from ANU for the New South Wales Natural Resource Commission about the impacts of timber harvesting on koalas in northern New South Wales, which concluded that the impacts were minor. So I think there's an ongoing misunderstanding in the Australian community about the impacts of forest management activities on biodiversity. Um, but again, we're challenged as a practitioner community, um, as a more general Australian community, to think through how we manage our landscapes for the multiple values they have in the face of the converging pressures that we're now seeing from an expanding uh, population and that commitment seems to have been uh, restated again with the new government um, uh, from a continuing expansion of, of resource use in the broad sense um, and from changing climate. Uh, and no, it's these sorts of images from the State of Environment report that I think illustrate what we really need to be concerned about. Uh, the left hand side from the most recent State of the Environment report changes in rainfall trends over the last 120 years on the left, on the right, coincidentally, 1960 to 2020. So that's the same period as my lifetime. Um, and, you know, the dramatic shifts, the, the redder, redder colour, of course, is the drier climate. This is from the 2011 State of Environment Report. I was a member of that panel and it's work that CSIRO did looking at the dissimilarity of future environments across Australia under particular climate change projections. This is a mid-range projection. The more purple the colour, the more different the environment is to what we have now. Um, and the conclusion from that work is that across something like 85% of the Australian landscape, the conjunction of temperature and rainfall conditions are going to be outside the sort of adaptive range of the vegetation that's there now. So I, just, I think every time I look at this picture, I think just how dramatic the changes that are coming are going to be. They're, they're going to take centuries probably to be manifest, but you know, a couple of hundred years time, our, our subsequent generations of Australians are likely to be uh, living in landscapes that are quite different to those that we're familiar with and those that have shaped our idea of what it is to be Australian. Uh, I think we're really, as with the rest of the world, we're just struggling to conceptualise or come to terms with the magnitude of that change. One of the phenomena of the last um, century of Australian forestry has been the substantial expansion of planted forests, particularly plantation forests, the um, shift to drawing almost all of our um, utility wood supply from those forests and now their vulnerability to the sort of landscape scale fire events, the extreme uh, uh, weather events that we're beginning to see more of. 
Um, and so, you know, to our west here, where the largest sort of area of plantation, softwood plantations forests in Australia and the Tumut Cumberumba region, a third of those forests were lost in one day, pretty much, in uh, 20, uh, late 2019. And a number of us in the room um, were able to go and visit those sites uh, a few weeks ago, and it's pretty, it's pretty salutary to see that. And the impacts through to the industry and um, consumer base that, that's built on that. So you know, whilst we've come, Australia's been a world leader in the development of much of plantation forestry activity and the processing of plantation forest products, we've got some big challenges there um, for the reasons, uh, you know, the same reasons that uh, we're challenged in other contexts. So when I think about what sh how should our response be, um, I think uh, that the foundation is really about landscape scale thinking and landscape scale responses and adaptation. Uh, and you know, over the last decade or so, the, the, the language of a landscape approach has become um, uh, very familiar in the broad international context. Uh, there's been work done by colleagues here, a paper by Ross Cunningham and David Lindenmeyer, thinking about uh, how we learn on a landscape scale. There's a whole body of work about that. There's a body of work about managing forests in the Anthropocene, um, an example that comes from the US rather than here. But it seems to me that we need consciously, as a number of colleagues have been arguing for some time, to see forested, uh, forested landscapes embedded in broader landscapes as learning landscapes, as ones in which we have to see a most ongoing real-time experiment. We have to learn from the consequences of different management interventions um, and adapt our future management on that basis. And for me, that means um, uh, different management regimes in different forests, um, in different native forests, in different planted forests, and observing how those different, differently managed forests respond to the pressures that they're under doing that consciously rather than, if you like, uh, coincidentally. That leads me to the th third of the three key points that I wanted to speak to, and that's about sustaining, restoring and enhancing for forest ecosystem services. Uh, and two, two graphs that sort of illustrate the converse in a way, again, from the State of Environment reports. On the left, uh, a picture uh, where the more purple the colour is, the more um, uh, is the core of the habitat condition. Uh, and if you can see that um, on image, uh, it's essentially maps to the areas of agricultural and urban activity in Australia, um, uh, or intensive, more intensive agricultural activity. Um, and on this map in brownie colour, um, deforestation between 1990 and, and 2019. And, you know, my home state of Queensland leads the world yet again, um, unfortunately. Uh, so globally, we're into year three of the UN decade of ecosystem restoration, which acknowledges the significance of that issue globally. We have international initiatives like the Bond Challenge, which is a voluntary commitment to uh, forest and landscape restoration. Uh, in the Australian context, I think we've sort of been a bit disconnected from, from all of that. Unfortunately, we've got our own, you know, homegrown world leading land care movement, a picture of Bob and Hazel Hawk back when that was launched in South Australia in 1989, I think is the picture. We've had some recent sort of um, follow ups with initiatives like Restore Australia post the bushfires but we've still got a very fragmented policy framework. We've got a focus, you know, in the commercial forest arena of just expanding commercial planted forests. Um, the new government built on the former government's intentions and introduced a biodiversity credit scheme, but we've still got a lot of, to my, to my mind, silos in the way we think about commercial production versus um, investment in, in ecosystem, other ecosystem services of landscapes. And, uh, for those of us who've worked with progressive farmers, of whom there are many, uh, people in this room might know John Weatherston, um, uh, whose property uh, near uh, Gunning was one that we used to 
visit with student classes when, when that was possible. Um, and, you know, farmers like John, uh, who are integrating tree growing into their other farming activities, uh, reminded that that is the way that land managers, farmers typically think about what they're, they're doing. We've got a lot of academic work about that topic, um, recent publication by CSRO colleagues, but really we've got a big policy vacuum about farm forestry and about um, the ways that we can deliver um, the multiple benefits of planted trees in the landscape um, and their integration with, with remnant natural forest. Uh, and so just as in the land care movement, there's been a lot of discussion about you know, how land care, need, we need to find ways to sort of scale land care up so it's having impact. Um, I think we think about that, that more generally in what I'm thinking of as a forest and landscape restoration arena that includes um, productive uh, use of the landscape as well as the value of um, non-consumptive ecosystem services. We've got a couple of subtopics in this larger theme. One is how we develop uh, a stronger bioeconomy in Australia. And um, this is a UN uh, UNEP, United Nations Environment Program report from a couple of years ago with projections for resource use globally, the sort of obviously unsustainable projections of consumption of non-renewable materials that bring us to the conclusion that we have to draw more strongly. Uh, on renewable materials in a whole range of ways and the forestry sector should be central to that. And you know, we are having, um, that there are ways in which we're achieving that. Um, a lot of um, work globally about the role of forest products in a bioeconomy. Um, we have our own wooden multi-storey building uh, over in, in Canberra, um, a couple of them in fact. And you know, elsewhere in the world and now in Australia, we've got biorefineries that are producing transport fuel from, from wood. Uh, so we've got the sort of precursors of the next stage of, um, of, a bio, of, a, of a bioeconomy. But again, I think in the Australian case for a range of reasons, what I think of broadly speaking is the climate wars on one hand, the forest wars on the other, we really haven't made the sort of progress that I think we need to make. Uh, we're also, you know, um, in essentially a wood shortage for a range of reasons. Uh, there hasn't been any expansion of um, longer rotation plantations for decades, and the current ownership structure of those plantations doesn't lend itself to further investment. Uh, we've had work, bodies of work, including my colleagues at Melbourne University, around ways that the forest sector and the farming community might better work together uh, to integrate commercial tree production and other agricultural activities. And so I'm just revisiting that same theme that I spoke to a few moments ago with the picture of John Weatherston. I also want to have a sort of footnote in this, not footnote, but a, another subtopic in this theme Australia is one of the world's most urbanised nations. And, you know, despite the fact that, you know, electric utes are going to ruin the weekend for macho Australian blokes in the bush and all that sort of stuff, mostly we're a very urban nation. And for most people in their day-to-day -day life, it's green infrastructure in cities that really matters for their immediate quality of life. Uh, you know, we're so fortunate to live in one of the world's greatest green infrastructure cities in, in Canberra. And, you know, we can be worried about the lack of investment into maintaining its quality, which um, colleagues, some colleagues in the room have to grapple with on a, on a daily basis. But I think um, the significance of green infrastructure in cities, um, you know, pioneering work by people like Chris Frack, who's, who's here in the audience, um, it's now much more widely recognised. The challenge is sort of delivering on it um, in ways that, um, establishing a priority in ways that, that governments will invest in. And of course, that, that investment's part of a broader family of how we think about um, trees and forests as part of nature-based solutions and to, to um, a whole range of environmental and social challenges. So if we look at the global literature, we find that the focus um, is very strongly on uh, how green infrastructure in which trees and forests are uh, a strong, but not the only element, um, can be 
uh, integral to, to those responses. And um, a very important paper, I think, by Bill Jackson and colleagues published a couple of years ago, arguing the case for thinking about Australia's forests more broadly as the foundation of nature-based solutions across our landscape, both urban and rural. So that's my three sort of key points, and that leads me to you know, some uh, sort of few concluding points about the future of Australian forests. I think uh, that they're increasingly, that the future uh, and management of our forests is, is, is increasingly and should increasingly be led by First Nations Australians in partnership with those of us who are not First Nations. It should be adaptively, sorry, it should be uh, adaptive and, and consciously experimental across all sorts of forested landscapes because we're going to be facing conditions that we are not familiar with and that we aren't used to responding to. We need restoration for multiple purposes at scale. I've, I've said regional scale here because that seems to be the way that, that Australia works best in many respects in, in terms of landscapes. Um, but we need nature-based solutions across the whole landscape, including in our, in our cities. Uh, and in doing that, I think just a little sort of advertising um, I'll come to in the next slide, I think it's helpful to uh, proactively imagine the future, think about the future and, and respond proactively. And I guess I was a little bit skeptical about that till I did some work with colleagues here in the Fenner School uh, and CSIRO, so um, Steve Cork, Steve Lade and uh, Simon Ferrier. We did some work over about six months um, till earlier in this year for the New South Wales Natural Resources Commission, thinking about the future of New South Wales forests, part of a family of work of thinking about the future. Uh, those of you who are devotees of megatrends might have seen the most recent CSIRO report, that's the graphic on the left, about uh, CSIRO's assessment of Australian megatrends and in that graphic, um, there's a, a sort of trend that's identified as leaner, greener and cleaner that we might think about the nature-based solutions and bioeconomy contributing to very strongly. Um, the work that we did for the NRC is there um, on their website and uh, I'll only refer to it very briefly with this sort of illustrative slide. Um, we took a framework that they've been using to assess sustainable forest management in New South Wales forests and we essentially, we developed eight scenarios from the most optimistic, which we called restoring New South Wales, I think, to the least, uh, that's up here, to the least optimistic, which, which inspired by the novel Greenwood, we called the great weathering, a slight adaptation of the great withering in that book. Um, and these triangles represent the extent to which those scenarios deliver solutions or del deliver outcomes for people, um, for nature um, and for, what's the third one? Culture, so, economics of society, culture and nature. Um, and you can see that the, where the coloured um, part of the triangle is represents the extent to which those imagined futures uh, delivered against each of those, those goals. So uh, I was converted, um, Steve Cork, if you're listening, I was converted by that process to being less of a skeptic about the value of futures thinking and appreciating how it can help us think more proactively about the future. So I think those sorts of activities are part of what we might want to think about investing more time and resources in. Um, I also think that there are multiple pathways to those outcomes. Um, you know, we learned during COVID about the diversity of responses that are possible in Australia to crises, um, uh, but uh, you know, most literature, most academic thinking would suggest that um, you know, following a diver allowing a diversity of pathways to emerge is a positive uh, element, builds in resilience. I think we do want those uh, pathways to be as locally led as possible and as strongly supported institutionally as possible. And I don't think we've done so well on that in Australia. I think that the way our politics has been emerging has become quite um, urban centric. Uh, and um, I don't think we've found good ways to build more inclusive conversations across diverse communities. Um, there are some 
promising um, initiatives that perhaps um, begin to address that, a new initiative called the Gippsland Forest Dialogue that's modelled on the International Forest Dialogue. I've been part of the International Forest Dialogue that's got its um, secretariat at Yale University. It's been going for about 20 years and addresses difficult forest issues around the world. Um, uh, the Gippsland Forest Dialogue is a group of local stakeholders who are concerned about the future of Gippsland's forest from a variety of perspectives and are working together in a structured way to address those. In another domain, we might think about the Fire Sticks Alliance that links uh, traditional owner fire managers across the country in a consortium to learn from each other and to uh, implement um, stronger uh, traditional burning regimes, implement them more, more strongly. Um, I want to move now to the future of Australian forestry and those many of you heard me lecture before and you've probably heard me refer to this quote from Jack Westerby pictured here talking in Australia in 1983, the former head of FAO's forestry department um, and underwent a conversion on the road to Damascus more or less in a forestry sense. Um, thinking about the role of forests simply from, from thinking about the role of forests simply as a vehicle for economic development to one in which uh, he understood more fully the breadth of forest values um, and how they needed to be manifest for different people in the community. And he wrote in 1967, it's part of that sort of conversion process, that forestry is not about trees, it's about people, it's about what people want from forests. So I'm, I'm thinking about forestry in that way. The first point I'd make in a few observations, a short series of observations about this issue is that there are many lessons from history. Uh, we've had you know, more than a hundred years of professional forestry um, uh, in, practiced in Australia. And before that we had um, uh, learning uh, both from traditional owners and from um, you know, predating the beginning of forestry education here. And there are, there's a wealth of learning that colleagues have written about in relation to those experiences. So I'm thinking about you know, books like Tim Bonnie Hades around uh, how in the late 19th century concern about the wanton destruction of Australian forests led to their conservation and reservation and the establishment of forest agencies. Thinking about a couple of John Doug Arbel's books there, um, the history of Australian forestry more, more generally, um, since um, European settlement in particular, the role of particular individuals and, and the learning that journey that they are on, a, a book about Charles Lane Poole. And we can learn from books like that of Judith Ajani, our former Fenner School colleague, um, around you know, what we've come to call the forest wars and how we can move beyond those. So if I think 100 years back, I think the evidence is that Australian foresters were thinking about these things. They were very concerned about deforestation and, and forest degradation. That was the reason for the establishment of state forests and state forest agencies. It was a constant preoccupation for the first 50 years or so. You know, my, I'm most familiar with Queensland. Think of uh, Swain, EHF Swain, riding around the Atherton Tablelands on horseback, campaigning against the government's um, intentions to um, uh, let more of the Atherton Tableland forests for dairy farming. You know, and he, he eventually failed in that endeavour and was sacked. And the Royal Commission that was appointed that he was shadowing talked about the productive wealth of the country being uh, limited by the fact there are too many rather than too few trees. Um, I think of my own childhood when my dad, um, in a few years after that picture was taken, would spend a lot of time in land courts in Queensland making the case about why land that was under public tenure should not be alienated, a forested land under public tenure should not be alienated for, for farming. Um, so those preoccupations have been a strong um, focus for the first century of Australian forestry. So too have been adapting knowledge and learning about the Australian environment, learning how to manage uh, our native forests in a range of ways for a range of purposes, learning about how to establish and grow and um, 
uh, process plantation forests um, and capitalising on the unique properties of Australian native timbers, but also the plantation species we grow here. There's a history of working with First Nations peoples. Um, there's many histories that speak to the connection between the forestry sector over the past century or more and, uh, and um, local uh, Indigenous communities. Um, I think Australian forestry has always been quite strongly internationally connected, first to Europe, but then, you know, subsequently to the US, and that's been a real benefit uh, to Australia, but also elsewhere in the world. And 100 years ago, um, uh, those concerned with forestry were also focused on establishing a forestry education system, which happened here in Canberra, but also at the University of Melbourne. If we think about the present, I think we can see many of those themes still very strongly, although perhaps the, the context and the future look a bit different. We're still concerned about deforestation and forest degradation. It's not happening primarily through forestry activities. It's happening as it was 100 years ago through conversion of land to other uses. We need to still be concerned, very concerned about adapting our knowledge to the management of Australia's future forests, because as I've argued, they're going to be different from those that we've come to know in the past century. Um, we're going to need to relearn, I think, and experiment and find out how to, how to manage those forests sustainably. We're going to have to manage them for resilience. We're going to have to uh, invest more effort in restoration, and we're going to have to focus more on cities. We're going to have to figure out how we sustain plantation forests that are our major wood supply source into a climate change future when there's more competition for water, more risk from fire and disease, and how we capitalise on a whole range of new technologies that help us make better use of the wood that we harvest. I've argued that we should be strongly supporting and enabling First Nations Australians and their management of forests. And now, I and many others in this room have benefited from the work that we do with partners in the region, organisations like ACR sponsoring that, or our other connections through education and research internationally. So I think that remains a strong theme. Um, most of us in this room who are interested in forests are beneficiaries of a very good education system, uh, one that um, you know was funded well. Uh, and was concentrated largely here at the University of Melbourne. Now we've got a much more fragmented uh, forestry education and research system. Um, and we've got the challenges of contemporary educational economics that make it very hard to sustain um, specialised degree programs um, in a sort of mass education market. So I think there are lots of commonalities, but some you know, manifest in different ways. Uh, in that sort of look over the, the last century. So in conclusion, I guess I'd say that if we think about the future of forests and forestry in Australia, um, there are a number of key elements that come to my mind. The first is that we've, there's a big picture uh, and we've been buried in the small picture of forest wars and climate wars. Um, forests are a nature-based solution to the challenges that we face and we need to be working from that platform. Uh, we've got a dated um, national forest policy in Australia. Um, I think uh, just as with other elements of our national life, it's time to think about revisiting that. Fraught, of course, because we've got to acknowledge and navigate the very strongly divergent opinions about our forests. But how else do we do that uh, without trying to chart um, a planned way to do that? And you know, some of these bottom-up initiatives, like the Gippsland Forest Dialogue, I think can be really got good starting points for that. We've also got examples from other countries, the North American Forest Congress of the late 1990s, early 2000s was a similar process in the US, for example. But more generally, I think there's a lot of scope for strengthening local level initiatives from which we can learn uh, more generally. And then finally, um, we need to find ways of um, aligning and sustaining investment from both the public and private sector towards those forest goals. We've seen, for example, land care or natural resource management movements really falter 
uh, as governments have sort of waxed and waned in the funding commitment to them. Um, Garno's 2009 climate change report envisaged a future in which uh, financing to um, restoration and management of forests across the landscape would flow from a price on carbon. That didn't happen then, maybe it's time for it to happen now. And we need to foster that across the breadth of forest ecosystem goods and services. So that's what I wanted to say in terms of my reflections. I hope they've um, helped stimulate thinking on, on your part because I know that people in the room are also thinking about these issues. Um, and I've come back to you know, conclude with that flag from um, 1927 that's now in the ANU archives. And um, I'm really delighted that the Fenner School has decided that's a good insignia and a good motto to use as the sort of signature line for our 15th anniversary. So you'll see more of that insignia, perhaps in sort of less tattered condition um, in the future. Thanks very much. Thanks so much for that, Peter. Um, we've uh, got a couple of questions. If you don't mind taking those on the line, and we can also go to someone in the room if there's any. Um, one from uh, Hamid, uh, who spoke just the other week. Um, trying to understand what locally led means. How do you see the role of local level community action within an outside traditional owners community? And how do you see the role of local government in fostering the landscape approach? Thanks, yeah, um, short answer to a complex question. Um, if I took the Gippsland Forest Dialogue as an example, because I know a little bit about that from some early interaction with them, it's an initiative that in, includes local traditional owners and includes local government, includes other local stakeholders. Uh, so we, the particular form in which that manifests might vary from place to place. But I think the principle of inclusion and uh, those who are connected to a particular place finding the best way to express that for that community is probably the key starting point. I'll, I'll leave my answer at that for the moment. Pete, I'm happy to come back to a longer discussion subsequently. So there's one more question online uh, from Roger. Um, how urgent are the needs for new policy, say compared with climate change issues in general and with the pandemic? Oh, forests are much more important. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good, thanks Roger, that's a good uh, question. Um, if we look at what's happening internationally, some of you would know that I spend, um, you know, part of my time each year at the University of Freiburg, um, thinking more about international forest governance with my, my colleagues there. And, you know, in that arena, we see um, what we might think of as a forest agenda overwhelmed by the climate agenda the climatization of international forest governance, how we, we describe it. Um, so, you know, we have to recognize the connections between the two. And I've argued that the changing climate is a dominant factor in shaping the future we have to respond to. But I think we need to find space within that framework um, for uh, agreeing, discussing, negotiating, agreeing, and then enacting how we want to uh, manage, you know, that word means not intervening through to intervening and everything in between, um, to how we manage our, our forests in the future. And so uh, I think, um, I guess to me as an Australian citizen, and you know, you can contest this, all of you, but as an Australian citizen, I, I feel like we've been treading water on a lot of issues around the environment and sustainability for 20 years or so. Uh, and, you know, we, we certainly tread, water, tread a lot of water on almost everything over the last three years and perhaps arguably over longer than that. Uh, so I just think there's a lot of business we need to get back to. Um, uh, and, you know, our forests are a foundational national asset. Um, many people in this room and outside this room have spent careers trying to give effect to that value in the particular, you know, professional roles they have. Um, but I don't, I don't really see um, uh, forests having a the focus as a nature-based solution 
to the challenges we face in urban and rural environments. And I think they've got the level of acknowledgement that they need to have if we're going to they're going to realise their potential to deliver that. So it's sort of in that context that I'd make that argument. And of course, it's got to fit in with the whole set of other priorities. And if we're not talking about a republic for the moment, because we've got to sort out um, uh, the referendum on Indigenous representation first, then I guess forests might be a bit further down the queue, but we can probably walk and chew gum at the same time, at least on some days. Any questions in the room? Claire? Thanks. Head of um, Claire Howe from ABES. Um, thank you, I really enjoyed that presentation. It's it always lovely to regroup and reconnect back into the space. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts. Um, up to the two thirds, nearly 70% of Australia's forests are under private management, either on private freehold or leasehold. What are your thoughts around their the contribution? I mean, that is by far and away the largest proportion. What are, what are your thoughts in terms of the contribution that they can make to the nature-based solution? And then how do we make the connection in terms of engaging in that space? Yeah, uh, thanks, Claire. And you know, your statistics make the point for themselves, don't they? That they're fundamentally important. And we've got a history in most states of not really doing very well in policy terms, I don't think, um, in relation to private native forests or other forms of private forest. Um, uh, and you know, perhaps we have to um, begin again, really, in our thinking, as um, some of you in this room have um, participated in classes with me, and you know, we've heard from people like Rowan Reed, who talked about a farmer-centric view or a landowner-centric view of how we think about um, the objectives and the support that we give uh, private forest owners. So, um, you know, I think that it's an it's it's an area of policy significance, uh, which was sort of recognised at one level, but haven't really been able to deliver on um, more broadly. So thanks for flagging that. I'll add it to my list of points. There's one other question on the line that may be getting in the weeds a little, but um, from Phil, wood is a useful uh, commodity, but is becoming less available. How do we set about to increase its production? Uh, no, that's probably not in, that's not in the weeds at all. I don't think. I think it's a really fundamentally important question. It sort of links to, in a way, to the question Claire just uh, asked, because one way, obviously, the only way, um, really, is to find ways of um, the forestry sector and private forest owners, whether they're owners of standing forest that um, can be managed for production as well as that that should be managed for conservation. Uh, or owners of land for whom trees would be an asset. And um, those of us who spent the weekend over near Laurel Hill a couple of weeks ago were regaled by a number of, of former private forest owners who um, didn't do financially very well out of investing their time and money in trees. And that's been a pretty common story uh, in the sort of Australian case. So uh, I think that um, the work, the, I can't see a way that we can respond to that issue without finding a different way to have um, farmers, uh, without, without having farmers grow trees for production as well as for land care purposes. And we just don't seem to have found that. We're on two o'clock, aren't we? Yeah. We are just on two o'clock. So there's no other points in the room. We will close off there, I guess. Can I just say then, Pete, before you do, um, I hope that uh, for that, thanks everybody in the room for being here and for being so quietly respectful. And you know, for those out on Zoom, no option but to be quietly respectful, but thank you too. Um, I do, yeah, despite my comments earlier on about um, still thinking that I'm as young as I was when Jeff Carey and Chris Brack and I first met, um, uh, I think, um, I've tried to reflect a bit on on what I've learned in um, you know the last 25 years here at Fenner and working in the Australian forestry sector, and it, you know there's a lot of frustrations aren't there over the last couple of decades, um, but I think we've got to find ways of putting those aside and looking at what we can contribute to the future. And you know the need is so great and the opportunities I think are so great, uh, and I hope that you know um, 
my ideas will help you know stimulate other ideas and that we can build on those so thanks for being part of the monologue if not the conversation